Good afternoon, and welcome to UCF Coastal's Lunch on the Coast speaker series. I'm Dr. Graham Worthy, Director of UCF Coastal. Through this speaker series, I hope you gain appreciation for the extent of basic and applied coastal research underway here at UCF. Orlando may be an inland city, but we still contribute to the issues facing our coast and are in turn impacted by those same issues. One of the goals of UCF Coastal is to grow public awareness about the amazing coastal resources we frequently take for granted. To achieve that goal, we've assembled an incredible team of cutting edge researchers who serve as a resource for everyone from marine scientists to the general public, businesses, and policymakers. Our Lunch on the Coast speaker series is running from July through December with one speaker each month. Through this series, we're proud to highlight some of the recent research undertaken by the diverse interdisciplinary faculty of UCF Coastal. You'll learn what it really means to live in a coastal state with expert perspectives ranging from archaeology to coastal planning, from engineering and economics to ecosystem and human health. You'll get an appreciation for the full range of issues currently facing our coasts and the resources that UCF Coastal is bringing to bear to help foster an understanding of those threats and hopefully chart a path forward. Now let me pass you over to our moderator who will be introducing you to this month's speaker and we'll also be running our question and answer session following the talk. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the Lunch on the Coast speaker series. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Emmerich. I'm the Director of Research for the National Center for Integrated Coastal Research, better known as UCF Coastal, and an Associate Professor of Public Administration. Today, I'm very pleased to announce, uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Sarah Barber. Dr. Barber is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and a founding member of UCF's National Center for Integrated Coastal Research, or Coastal Systems. Uh, Dr. Barber is an archaeologist specializing in ancient Mexico civilizations, specifically coastal civilizations, where she uses geospatial modeling, remote sensing, and more classic archaeologic excavation to build a knowledge base about Mexico's prior coastal residents. Dr. Barber is, has more recently begun similar work around the Indian River Lagoon, the 156 mile long estuary on Florida's east central coast. Today, Dr. Barber will be speaking with us about how we can learn from the past to understand the future of coastal resources. Her research into how humans have survived, thrived, and declined in coastal areas provides us a valuable set of information on how we currently live in our coastal areas and interact with them, and what we might consider in thinking about building towards sustainable futures. So without further ado, uh, well, please welcome Dr. Uh, Barbara. My name is Stacy Barber. I'm an archaeologist, and I study the long-term relationship between people and coastal ecosystems. So people have had really profound impacts on the environment for a very long time. In Florida, we don't know the extent to which people impacted ecosystems because that work is still undergo underway or ongoing. There's definitely a difference, right, between paving over huge swaths of Florida's coastline and the conditions that obtained even in the 1880s or 90s. But that doesn't mean that people didn't change their ecosystems. So we decide where we're headed based on the past by looking at long-term processes. The benefit of pulling archeology span into studies of modern ecosystems is that archaeology can give us sort of the beginning, middle, and end of processes that played out over, say, 500, 1,000, or 2,000 years. So right now, we're obviously in the middle of major environmental and social changes. We don't know where we're going, but we can look at past examples where those changes already happened and played out completely. And I think that Archaeology enables us to sort of take this like tiny little bell curve and make it a huge bell curve so that we can really understand the potential ways that humans can improve ecosystems by changing practice and reprioritizing our resource use 
as well as enabling us to identify ways that we've messed it up before and try to avoid those. Hi, I think it's my turn to start. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen so that everyone can um, see what I wanna talk about today. And if someone could just let me know if it's going through. Let's see. That's perfect. Um, okay, unfortunately, for some reason, it's not allowing me to do like the, oh, there we go. Okay, all set. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm so excited to have a chance to talk about my research in Florida. As Dr. Emmerich noted at the beginning, I'm actually a Mesoamerican archaeologist by training, so I do a lot of work in Mexico. But that research is, um, I think, very logically tied to what I've been doing in Florida for the last five years now. So what I want to do before I start is I want to take a moment to reflect on the complicated history of Florida by acknowledging that the land around the Indian River Lagoon and the lagoon itself was ancestral and traditional territory of several indigenous groups, including the Ice, Suruke, and Ume tribes of Florida, and descendant peoples such as the, the Seminole tribe of Florida and Oklahoma and the Miccosukee tribe of Indians. I acknowledge the history of Florida in which indigenous and diasporic groups were forever changed by colonial violence, European introduced diseases, forced movement, and removal. And that complex history is precisely what I want to talk about today. And I had forgotten what I put in, in, the, um, in the video, so I'm really glad the message is going to really be consistent because I want to talk about the past and why the past matters. I want to convince you that the past matters. And I don't mean the past as in last year, the last hundred years, I mean all of the past. Every one of us here today are living in a world that was created by the past. And surprisingly, we tend to take a really narrow view of the past when thinking about where we are now and where we're going in the future. And that narrow view is a problem when we make important decisions on the, based on the past, like where to put housing, how to improve water quality, or what species to protect to keep our environment healthy. So which path should we be using and why? As an example, I'm going to talk about the Indian River Lagoon as a case study. I lead an interdisciplinary research team focused on the IRO and on Pacific Mexico. And I want to introduce the team these goals which are not modest, <laughs> uh, so you understand the scale of the undertaking. I want to describe the long-term history of the area around what is now Cape Canaveral. As um, Dr. Emrich pointed out at the beginning, the Indian River Lagoon is really large, and so my team has focused really on the northern part of the lagoon. We're going to start in the Ice Age, because why not? And then we'll talk about the history and the archaeological and interdisciplinary research that my team has been doing around the lagoon following that. So this is work in progress. I cannot uh, promise you definitive answers, but I will try to give you some observations that you can take away. And then I want to do a quick trip through the last 500 years and look towards the future. What challenges does this lagoon face and what path should we use to understand its future? Okay, our collaboration aims to understand the social and environmental conditions of the Indian River Lagoon over the past 10,000 years. And there's a little bit of a red herring in there, which I'll point out in a second. But our long-term goals for the project include documenting geological, hydrodynamic, and eco ecological change in the Northern IRL. And the map that you see here, make sure, oh, can you guys see my mouse pointer? Yes? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Um, the map you see here is really our approximate study area. So there's a lot of Indian River Lagoon that I'm not going to talk about today. But we also 
want to evaluate how human populations have both generated and responded to these natural system changes. The map here shows you some of the archaeological and geological sites that we're using. Some of this work uh, down here in Cape Canaveral, I have directed myself archaeologically. Uh, my collaborator, Joe Donahue, has worked here um, taking a core, sediment core of the lagoon. And then some of these other sites and cores are published work by others. Because, of course, understanding the past of a huge ecosystem like this and humans is far more than the work of one or even a dozen people. This is a big ask to try to study a, a large system in this complex way. So I have an interdisciplinary team that I work with. For the sake of time today, I'm really going to focus on the archaeology because that's my contribution, the geology, and the paleoethnobotany. Very quickly, paleoethnobotany is the study of um, the use and occurrence of plants in the past. And I'll give you some more examples of that in a moment. So the remains of past animals, including fish, bivalves like oysters, come from archaeological excavations at the burn site on the Banana River, a project that I co-direct. Along with pub published information from other sites, the ages of these materials, which are obtained from radiocarbon dating, offer a glimpse of what species lived in the IRL at what specific points in the past. A geologic vibracore, and that's shown here in the center, Joe Donahue, my collaborator, is wearing a pink hard hat, is a record of sediment deposition in the lagoon and the coastal floor over the last 9,000 years. And phytoliths, which are these little things here, this is a blow up of a microscopic image, are these little bits of glass, silica, that plants produce that are distinctive to family, genus, or sometimes even species. And they can tell us how plant communities change over time. So we combine all these data sources to characterize past ecological conditions and human resource use at known points in the past. So let me tell you a little bit about what we, my team, and others have learned so far and where we plan to go. So my subtitle, as I mentioned, is a bit of a red herring because, of course, the Indian River Lagoon did not exist 12,000 years ago. The Cape and the barrier islands all formed after the end of the ice age. In fact, this whole area would have been between 30 and 50 miles inland during the ice age. Florida used to be a lot bigger than it is today. So what is today Cape Canaveral and Merritt Island would have been very, very far from the coast. What we see today as our coastline is in fact the end result of land out here, what is now out to sea, getting churned up by the ocean as sea levels rose at the end of the ice age and redeposited on the coastline of Florida. So there's really nothing on any of those barrier islands that's older than about 6,000 years. Everything else is uh, younger. Merritt Island, I should add, does have a few older spots. They've actually found Ice Age animal bones on parts of Merritt Island. But of course, it wouldn't have been an island at that time. It would have been a, ri a ridge well inland from the coast. And in fact, this history of the Indian River Lagoon and all of the coast of Florida really is written right into the islands as we walk onto them. These are what are called LIDAR images of Cape Canaveral. They were produced by Glenn Doran, an archaeologist, and some collaborators uh, in the sort of mid aughts. And all of these little lines that you're looking at here are old beach ridges. They're old beach, beach fronts. And if we take a section like this one here, where you can see all those lines and you blow it up, you can see rises, which is an old dune ridge and swales between that ridge and the new ridge that's forming. What we have determined through this research is that Cape Canaveral used to be just a little bit of spit, a little spit of sand over here, and it has slowly grown from west to east over the last 6,000 years. It is still growing up here, so this area is still increasing, and this area down here is still growing. This area, where there's a whole bunch of launch pads, is actually being eaten 
by the sea. So this is a very, very dynamic part of the Florida coast. Similar processes were underway all up and down the Atlantic coast. Around the Mosquito Lagoon, for instance, researchers have demonstrated that there used to be a bunch of holes in the barrier island where inlets allowed water in. Obviously, people living around the lagoon had to accommodate for these water channels. And the influx of salty water would have changed the kinds of plants and animals that arrived in the lagoon's waters and around its shoreline and where they were available. Now, changes like this wouldn't have been massive. The general conditions of the Indian River Lagoon's ecosystem have been very stable for about 6,000 years, but the distribution of species, where they lived and in what quantity would have changed due to these smaller scale geological and environmental processes. So let's talk about people. That's what archeologists like to do. We know that people have been living in Florida for at least 12,000 years, so during the Ice Age. There are some very old archeological sites on the mainland in this area, including the Windover Pond site, which is way up here at the top, and the old Bureau site way down here at the bottom. And I have to say that PowerPoint is not well designed for north-south oriented geography. <laughs> so please bear with me on here. Both of these sites predate the formation of the lagoon. So the people that lived in these sites would not have been living in the ocean. They would have been living well inland. Windover is a really famous site. It's in Titusville, and it's what, what's known as a charnel pond. And this is where people um, sometimes buried their dead in the soft peat at the bottom of a pond. And Windover burials were between 8,000 and 7,000 years ago. At least 168 people were buried here, but over the course of of a thousand years, right? So this is a really long period of time and only 168 burials, which gives you a sense that we are talking about very low populations in this part of Florida. The old Vero site to the south also produced human remains, also from about the same time period, a little bit younger, say eight to 6,000 years. And like the Windover site, those, those individuals may have been buried in boggy, uh, sediment near a creek. The old Vero burials were found in the 19 teens, about 1913, so we just don't have as much good information about those. We know that these early Florid Floridians, of whom there were not very many, moved around a lot. The stone tools from the Vero site, the old Vero site, for instance, included points that look kind of like this one right here. This is from a different source, but they look like this and they came from, they were made with stone that's, that's um, outcrops all the way up in Ocala. So people are getting around Florida. They're highly mobile. They hunted and fished locally available game and they made cloth and basketry. And this is a teeny tiny fat fragment of cloth from the old Vero site that would have been made from the fibers of the sable palm plants. They may also have used saw palmetto, but they were using palms to produce cloth. It would have been probably pretty rough on your skin, uh, but better than a sunburn. They also gathered many edible plants, and uh, these would have been available in this version of Florida, which was much drier and cooler than the Florida that we know today, which today sounds really nice. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to be in a cooler version of Florida? That's how people lived in Florida for a really long time. They often lived around rivers and lakes where fresh water and food were reliably available. They have, may have visited the coasts, but there's no evidence that they were doing any offshore fishing. And that requires really advanced technology, which it doesn't seem like um, this group of people had in terms of boating. Boating technology is, is um, very specific. And without the lagoons, the coasts just didn't really have the appeal that inland waterways would have had. So people spent a lot more time inland. They adapted to changes in climate which included warmer, wetter periods and cooler, drier periods. And it was probably a pretty good life. Everything changes when sea levels stabilize. And that means when the glaciers are done doing their melting and sea levels have reached the, uh, uh, basically the height that they are today. From that point on, there is a slow buildup of sand on the coast to create the lagoons and the ecosystems of the Atlantic region around Cape Canaveral. Because of all that sand buildup, Unfortunately, as the sand is being brought in, remember all those dunes are being created. Early lagoon uh, occupations are deeply buried. And I don't know if you've ever tried to dig a deep hole in sand, but it's really dangerous. And 
if we want to find those early occupations, they're probably so far down now that they may be below uh, the groundwater level. So we have this huge gap in our knowledge. After the lagoons are formed, we just don't know what people are doing out there. We assume that people are using the coasts, but we don't see much evidence of it until about 500 BCE. Before I move forward, I want to really quickly give you a sense of how archaeologists talk about things that happened in the past. We tend to use two different methods for talking about the past. We can use the Eurasian calendar system, which would be BCE, before Common Era, or CE, Common Era, formerly known as BCAD. And that's derived from the Christian calendar system. Or we can talk simply about years ago, about how long ago something happened. Most of us are pretty comfortable with the Common Era. So if I tell you 2021 of the Common Era, that seems like a little too much information. But if I tell you 2000 BCE, that actually was 4,000 years ago, because you have to add 2,000 years to it. So what I'm going to try to do is when we get into the Common Era, I'm going to just say the year. Um, and when we talk about the older stuff, I'll talk about years ago. Back to the timeline. We have this big gap, which I re really can't tell you very much about, except that people are around. They're doing something. But after 500 BCE, archaeological sites become much more prevalent around the northern Indian River Lagoon. In fact, if you visit somewhere like Canaveral National Seashore, you can see archaeological sites everywhere. Big piles of seashells, like you see on the left, one stacked upon the other. These shells are part of what is called shell middens, which is basically places where people came repeatedly, we don't know over how long a period, and they harvested nearby uh, shellfish or fish, and they prepared them either to take back to the rest of their family members who were camped somewhere else, or they would spend a little time in one place. You can see here, for instance, this is evidence of human uh, working of a conch shell. And in this shell midden right here, you can actually see layers. You see these little lines. These are showing you periods of activity. And then these blacker layers are either periods of burning or periods of soil formation when people weren't coming. The density of shells shows you that these, these activities are being repeated for years, decades, even centuries. In some places, you will literally see miles of shoreline littered with tossed out shell. So this doesn't have that density that I showed a second ago, but all of the shell, humans put that there. These places aren't only a reminder of the people who came before us, they're an extraordinary snapshot of animal species that lived in the lagoon at the time, and a demonstration of the product productivity of the lagoon in the past. It is amazing how much food people pulled from these waters. So let me give you an example. The Mosquito Lagoon is about the northernmost part of the IRL. And today, the Mosquito Lagoon has one inlet right here, Ponce Inlet. And so as you can imagine, the farther you get from the inlet, there's now another canal here, but the farther you get from the inlet, the less saline the water is going to become. <clears throat> and we know it was the same. 500 years ago, because when the Spanish arrived in 1605, a 25-year-old Spanish soldier left St. Augustine and traveled the length of the Indian River Lagoon and made this really amazing map. Here's Ponce Inlet. This is New Smyrna, what is now New Smyrna Beach. And here's the Mosquito Lagoon. And you can see there's no inlets anywhere in this map. But as I mentioned before, if you look at the geology, Indian River or Mosquito Lagoon used to have five Inlets. So there was a lot more saline water moving into the lagoon than we know today, than there is today. Many more opportunities for marine water and fresh water to interact. These closed at different times in the past, and we think from south to north. So these inlets were all closed before this last one up here near the Turtle Mound archaeological site would have closed around 550 of the Common Era. And this inlet closure appears to have happened right between two periods of climate change, the Roman warm period here and the medieval warm period. This means that the Mosquito Lagoon, and indeed the IRL as a whole, offer, this, offer us this great opportunity to understand the interactions between climate, geology, human choices, and ecosystem conditions. I mentioned a moment ago that the general environment of the Indian River Lagoon hasn't changed much for 6,000 years. But the results of several research projects 
including that of my team, suggests that these smaller scale changes may have resulted from things like inlet openings and closings, as well as human actions. And I want to give you some examples. Um, those smaller changes would have affected how people could and did use the Indian River Lagoon. So this image shows the kinds of plants that were living around the lagoon over time. And I wanted to take a moment to just describe this chart because it's not an obvious. We took a big core of sediment. I showed you that picture at the beginning. Every few centimeters, we took a radiocarbon sample to get a sense of how old the sediment in the core was. We then are able to estimate if we take a sample from 10 centimeters, it's going to be about 14 or 1500 of the common era. And if we go down almost uh, 1.25 meters, the sample is going to be 4,000 years old. Unfortunately, we didn't have any samples from the really deep stuff. But what we did find is that in sediment before the inlet, that last inlet closure, there's a pretty good amount of seagrass and other grassy plants. There are more trees, so mostly palm, but also hardwoods. There are also trees living in the lagoon at this time. But it's, you know, it's pretty close, the amount of the two um, different types of plants. That inlet closes, and our samples after the inlet closure show this steady decline in seagrass going all the way up until the beginning of the US colonial period. We have this very small sort of spike again in seagrass, but it's nowhere near the amount of seagrass that was living around this core location, 500 of the common era. This, um, these points chart the number of phytoliths that are present in the sample. I mentioned them earlier, I showed a picture. Imagine them as sort of the bones of plants. And so the more of those plant bones you find, the more likely that nearby a lot of those plants are living. And so we have this steady decline in grasses and this steady increase in tree species. That's exactly what you'd expect if less seawater is making it to the southern end of the lagoon after that in the closure. So here we have a relatively small scale change that almost certainly affected vegetation in the southern part of the lagoon. Archaeological evidence from sites shown here on the map also indicate changes in the species that people were eating following that in the closure. Although again, I can't give you uh, I can't give you causation at this point, this correlation. We definitely have a pattern. So let me show you what it is. And this is where the title of my talk comes from. I can tell you that leading up to 750 of the common era, Eastern oysters and saltwater clams made up almost 100% of all the shellfish that people were discarding. Oysters were 50% of the shellfish diet, as far as we can tell. But a few hundred, year, hundred years after that turtle mound closure, oysters are 6% of the shellfish dry, diet. So there's a huge drop in the amount of Eastern oysters that people are eating. Instead, they're eating a wider diversity of shellfish species, and they're eating um, a slightly different set of clam species than they were before. Other changes included a drop in reliance on certain fish species and an increase in other fish species, including increase in mullet, sea trout, and drum. Interestingly, a study of quahog clams by Hellman around the southern part of Mosquito Lagoon found a significant decrease in the size of those clams over this same period of time. Hellman argues, and I think it's a pretty reasonable argument, that this slow, steady decline in the size of the clams reflects the slow buildup of human overexploitation over time. And while we have many more questions and answers, there's a couple of interesting things to observe. This is our trend line, so you can clearly see the drop in oyster or clam shell size. Prior to the inlet closure, when people are eating a lot of oysters, the clams that people are eating tend to be bigger. After they stop eating oysters and after the inlet closes, the clams tend to be smaller. That probably means that those bigger clams are no longer available to harvest. Humans have put pressure on them and the clams are no longer growing to full mature sizes. So people are building and adapting 
to small scale changes in the environment caused by geological processes and global climate change. And some of their actions in turn are affecting the ecosystem around them. And this isn't um, modern Florida. These are relatively small populations and they're still doing things to their environment that we can see in the archeological record. Now we aren't sure how mobile people were in that earlier before 750 time period, but after 750, people seem to be living around the IRL all year round and in larger numbers. The timing of some of that population growth is a little bit unclear, but certainly by 1300 of the common era, so before Europeans have arrived, we have people using the lagoon in these three very distinct ways. We have temporary camps where people were gathering and eating fish and shellfish and maybe staying in these places for a few days, a week, a couple of weeks. And those tend to be very small scatters of seashell that we see on the shoreline. But they're not spending a lot of time there. People also appear to have developed independent homesteads. So again, maybe a, a, an extended family, a couple of families living together. And that would be their base. And then they would go around the lagoon using canoes to gather fish, to uh, go to um, oyster beds, things like that. Gather that food, prepare it, and bring it back to the homestead. And finally, some people are living in large villages with mounds made of shell and sand into which the dead are being buried. And again, while populations are much, much lower than they are today, homesteads and villages definitely would have affected things like drainage patterns into the lagoon and the demand on resources for everyone to eat. I should quickly add population estimates for this time period are abysmally bad. So we really don't have any sense except maybe a few hundred to a few thousand people living on the entirety of the Indian River Lagoon. An example of one of these large village sites with a mound is the Burn site, which is located on the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station along the east bank of the Banana River. You can see it there on the map. It was a village site with a burial mound, one of dozens. There were many more all up and down the lagoon, almost all of which have been destroyed. The burn site was first excavated in the 1930s as part of the Civil Works Administration. Archaeology was deeply involved in um, part of the Great Depression government recovery efforts. So we see a lot of important archaeology done in the 30s. George Woodbury excavated the mound, but he never really reported his results. He did, however, say that the mound was 13 feet high, four meters, and over 52 feet across, about 16 meters. So it was pretty big, easily as big as a modern home. Today, the mound is wider and lower. And so this is what it looks like today. It doesn't look like much, right? It's just a little bump on the land. It looks like that because of the amount of damage that's been done to it. In addition to Woodbury's incredibly damaging excavations, uh, later people looted the site, and then somebody came back in with a backhoe and kind of tried to rebuild the mound. So what's there today is probably more or less a fantasy, unfortunately. In the foreground, you see what we call a repatriation mound. This was constructed so that human remains that are found on Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and Patrick Air Force Base can be reburied with respect. And so that's where, um, and that's been placed next to this historic burial mound. From 2017 to 2019, I and UCF faculty have uh, collaborated with Mr. Tom Penders of the US Space Force, shown here in our photograph, to study the burn site and other sites along the Banana River. So far, we've trained 54 undergraduate and graduate students in archaeological fields and laboratory methods. This is our 2017 team, so our very first year. Uh, my collaborator, Neil Duncan, who is also uh, anthropology faculty here at UCF, is one of my collaborators and also is the producer of all the phytolith information. So those little slides of um, uh, glass pieces from plants, that's wh where those come from, from him. Unfortunately, time just doesn't permit me to tell you everything that we've been doing at the burn site, but I want to make a few observations about what we think indigenous Floridians were doing in the final centuries before European contact, because the burn site is, dates to exactly that time period. It's really an amazing site in this regard. Okay, so imagine that it's 1934 and Woodbury has chopped that big mound in half. 
you're standing on the ground and you're looking at that cut. That's what this drawing shows us. What researchers found when Woodbury did his excavations, and my team independently verified in our excavations from 2019 uh, and 2018, is that the mound was built on top of a land surface, which is this layer right here, that had already been inhabited. We don't know much about the nature of that habitation, but our radiocarbon dates from our excavations suggest that it dates between 1100 and 1300 of the Common Era. The burn site does not have that long um, shell ridge that you see in other parts of the Indian River Lagoon. So we think it was probably um, a, a homestead or even a small village prior to the construction of the mound, but, but really we're kind of guessing because we just don't have much information. The mound itself would have been built after 1300, and it was used at least into the 1500s and possibly even into the 1600s. People were buried in this layer and this layer of the mound for a total of 52 burials. And the upper portion of the mound, so this layer right here, this sort of horizontal striped layer, contained layers of ash and shell and ash and shell. And what that indicates to us is that they were cooking a bunch of food, eating it and throwing away the waste cooking a bunch of food, eating it, throwing away the waste, and doing it again and again and again. Most people around the world have very different ideas about what to do with your garbage. So once you're done with the show, throw it over your shoulder and you're done. So what we think is happening is that large amounts of food are being brought to the Burns Mound from 1300 to 15 or 1600. People are having large feasts and sharing food together, preparing it together in the company of the dead who are there in the mound beneath them. We find support in the historic records that there was inequality among indigenous Floridians during this time. People buried in mounds were obviously special. Not everybody got buried in a mound. We don't have all of the data on who the individual people were that were buried in the Burns Mound. But as we understand it, they're all adults. So for instance, children aren't special enough to be buried in this type of location. And certain people had elaborate grave goods. This is an example of a pendant, it was made originally of European silver, probably salvaged from a shipwreck off the coast of Cape Canaveral, and then reworked into a meaningful shape by indigenous Floridians, and then buried with someone as an indication of that person's special status. The historical records attest that there was a political leader by the late 1600s living south of the Burns site who had the authority to receive tribute from shipwrecks from indigenous groups extending all the way from the Florida Keys up to the Cape Canaveral area. So there's definitely inequality and uh, large scale trade and movement of people going on in the late pre-Hispanic and early colonial periods. The alliance that I discussed where people are sending tribute almost certainly evolved out of contacts with the Spanish, but what sites like Burns tell us are that people have been living around the lagoon and modifying the landscape in impressive ways for nearly 700 years, if not more. And in fact, they were pulling a lot of food out of that lagoon. Food refuse near the mound is dominated by fish and shellfish, which is exactly what you'd expect. The, the Banana River is literally a stone's throw from where the mound is located. But we also have terrestrial and turtle species. And there were small numbers of amphibians, reptiles, invertebrates, shark, dolphin, and bird species that were found in the bones that were discarded near the mound. There are 30 different species of fish, including mullet, wheatfish, catfish, drum, pinfish, sheep's head, and burfish. We also found exotic species like skates, stingrays, and pufferfish. There were 35 different species of felt shellfish, including coquina, which would have come from the beach side of the barrier island, quayha clam, and several saltwater clam species. Six species of conch, true whelk, Florida crown conch, and knobbed whelk being the most numerous, and terrestrial animals, including white-tailed deer, rabbits, 
raccoons, opossums, the bones from three different black bears. I don't know who hunted those. And then six different turtle species, including marine species and gopher tortoise. So what is this telling us? Make sure we're doing well. Let me take a moment to think about what this means in terms of the past of the IRL. First of all, the IRL didn't even exist until after 6,000 years ago. So we really do have a nice beginning for the past of the IRL. Next, people are around, but they're not really using the lagoon in any impactful way for thousands of years. There just weren't that many people, and there were other places in Florida that were better to spend time in. Next, the geological changes that started with sea level stabilization after the ice age didn't just stop, right? The changes around the Mosquito Lagoon, for instance, would have caused inlet closures as recently as 550 of the Common Era. That closure likely had an effect on what plant and animal species lived in the lagoon and where those species were distributed. Right now, our data only allows us to observe that decline in grasses and increase in trees, but there are almost certainly other environmental changes. By 700 of the Common Era, there were a lot more people living around the lagoon. And these people, furthermore, cha made changes to their diet, at least in Mosquito Lagoon. They stopped relying on oysters, no oysters for lunch, and shifted to other bivalves and new fish species. I would love to tell you today what caused these changes, but we're still in the process of ruling out various options. This includes overexploitation of things like oysters. We know what happened with clams. Um, changed food preferences, changes in technology that maybe made it easier to catch fish. We can say that people appear to already be impacting the species that lived in the lagoon by a thousand of the common era as the Quahog clam uh, got smaller and younger due to overexploitation. Finally, indigenous use of the lagoon included landscape modification in the form of land clearance for villages mound building that would have affected drainage and the cumulative effects of all that discard of shellfish for years and years, for centuries, right? And again, it is literally reflected in the topography of Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and of um, Canaveral National Seashore. The way the water drains is due not necessarily to modern activity as much as ancient activity in those places that have been less developed. So ancient people absolutely changed the ecosystem in this region. All right, I wanna just quickly wrap up here by talking about this world of independent homesteads, villages, mounds, seasonal movement, fishing and shell fishing, because that's the world that the Spanish arrived to encounter. Sometimes we treat the past as if it begins when Europeans showed up. And I hope that I've convinced you that that is not the case. The past, and history don't start with Europeans. They only get sad and ugly at that point. Spanish records give us the names of the languages and the bodies of water in the Indian River Lagoon area from the 1500s. Up here to the north, you have speakers of the Timucua languages. Timucuan speakers were farmers. They actually grew corn. And so they used their coastline very differently than people in Central Florida did because they had to devote quite a bit of time to their inland farming activities. In the Indian River Lagoon area, you have the Soruque Lagoon. Oh, sorry. You have the Soruque Lagoon. You have the Great Ice Lagoon, which is now known as the Northern Indian River Lagoon, Mosquito Lagoon. The Ulamai Lagoon is the Banana River and the Pentawaya Lagoon, which is the Southern Indian River Lagoon. People in this region spoke uh, versions of the ice, language, and the whole uh, coast, all the way from the north to the south, were dotted with these villages like the burn site that had a large mound and a large settlement and people who were coming in and out, moving up and down the lagoon with canoes, harvesting a wide range of species to do things like throw feasts. The larger villages, especially ones like Burns, also probably had local leaders. The Spanish called them caciques which simply means chieftain, but it's probably better to think of them as a head man or woman. We don't actually know who would have been in charge. The Spanish were only gonna to talk to the men. So that's who we hear about. The efforts to keep the Spanish out of this region 
were very extensive for centuries. And in fact, we have a lot of Spanish documentation of their efforts to uh, colonize or at least subdue the IEs. Ultimately, the IEs are unsuccessful in keeping the Spanish out. That's why I'm giving this talk and not an indigenous Floridian. The ice were torn, up, torn apart by disease, violence, and kidnapping, uh, as well as enslavement. There are no self-identified IEs alive today. There would have been a population crash after about 1750 around the lagoon before Europeans or Euro-Americans started moving back into the region in the late 1800s. So very quickly, the IRL today, it is of course characterized as an ecosystem in crisis. This image here shows the most recent report card on water and seagrass quality in the lagoon. Just treat this like this for your kid's report card. F is not a good grade. And as you can see, there are lots of Ds and Fs in our report card. This report card is based on, wait for it, 25 years. 25 years of seagrass data and 23 years of water quality data. 25 years, that's great, it's important. However, I think we can very easily show that 25 years tells us very little about what this ecosystem is capable of, how this ecosystem does or does not reflect ideal conditions. In fact, what are the ideal conditions? Are they the pre-Hispanic conditions? post 1750 after we've had this population crash when all the IEs had died and been enslaved or post ice age, where does the past that we want to, to bring back begin? If we want to decide how to build, how to restore, how to clean the water, for instance, there's talk of opening an inlet in the Mosquito Lagoon. We can look at the past and it will tell us what conditions used to be like how people, geology, and climate have changed those conditions, and maybe what not to do. The past matters. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I think I speak for everyone, uh, Stacy, when I say thank you very much for this enlightening presentation. As a geographer, I was thrilled with all the maps and pretty pictures because, you know, without, without these things, we can't orient ourselves to what is truth or could be truth. Um, I would like to open it up for questions, and those with questions can type their questions into the chat area. We do have a few questions already. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so we're going to buzz through these like um, a Jeopardy speed round. Um, the first question, and these are not in order. Um, as I receive them, but more kind of trying to align them with a process. Um, can you identify uh, parallels between the way we impact the environment today and the ways indigenous people impacted the environment? Um, and can you give us maybe an example of one of those? Well, that's a great question. And yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say that in my presentation, I gave a couple of examples in that um, one of the things that we do that's been really, um, really impactful on the modern Indian River Lagoon is the way that we change the landscape around the lagoon, right? We have channelized bodies of water to affect how water flows into the lagoon. We punched holes through parts of the lagoon. Um, indigenous peoples in Florida did not undertake that, that scale of earth moving. Um, in Mexico, my other study area, they did, right? But not here. Um, However, I would argue that um, those sort of developmental accretions of big shell middens, like you know, many, many meters of just dumped shell refuse, that's gonna change how the water flows in and out of the lagoons. Uh, it's cumulative, it's not like the same as a backhoe doing it in a day, but those cumulative changes absolutely affect the lagoon. Thanks for that example. I have two questions about excavations. Um, I'm gonna ask them both and you can either answer them together separately or not at all. Uh, the first one comes from Elaine Norman. Thanks, Elaine. Is there any recent excavation at Turtle Mound? And the second one is related to ex excavation in general and it's related to climate change. Well, uh, climate, one of the direct impacts of climate change, although we're not necessarily seeing as bad as it could be, is sea level rise. 
Is there a specific time limit? I know you touched on this. Is there a specific time limit on how long you think you continue, you can continue these excavations before like the best buy date is done and you're, and you're you know, you just don't have an opportunity anymore? Those are great questions too. I'm gonna to take them separately because they are two, I think a little bit different. Um, so the, the Turtle Mound was actually recently excavated. And I think anyone who's visited Turtle Mound really gets what I'm talking about in terms of landscape modification. Like Turtle Mound is a multi-story building. It is huge. Um, the Turtle Mound is, was excavated recently by this great organization called the Southeast Regional Archaeological Center. They're affiliated with the National Park Service, which obviously has authority over um, all of the archaeological materials inside uh, Canaveral National Seashore. They have not yet published their results. So the report for the Turtle Mound excavations is still pending. And I can tell you a lot of us who are interested in the East Coast of Florida are really looking forward to those results because they did things like radiocarbon dating, which will give us a sense of how old Turtle Mound is. So that's the first question. And the second question, is there an expiration date on uh, what we can learn about these sites? Well, that question is like so beautifully timed. The research that we're doing at Burns was specifically designed to get what we can get out of it before it gets buried, uh, before it gets flooded by sea level rise. Yeah, um, we don't anticipate that those whole barrier islands are going to be completely covered, although um, Chris Emmerich, you would be a better person to speak about some of these things, right? Um, but the Burns Mountain site already goes into the lagoon, so I can walk, I can take my shoes off, and I have done it, and walked out into the lagoon and pulled artifacts out of the water because the site is already starting to be inundated. Um, I don't know that we have a specific time. It really depends on how bad things get. I anticipate that storm surges are gonna really badly damage sites like burns, oh, you know, 15, 20 years. I mean, even now we're getting damage to these sites, but I would say by 20 or 25 years from now, a lot of what could be done at burns will have to be finished. And I would echo that your sentiment there. I think we are, get, are fortunate to see not be seeing the impacts from sea level rise that have been expected thus far, but the storm surge is certainly going to be a problem. Um, another question related to mounds and digs and excavations, what should someone do if they are walking through the woods or somewhere and think they find something of archaeologic interest? Oh, thank you for asking that question. So there, the good news, there's good news and bad news on this. The good news is um, anything that you find of archaeological interest that is on publicly held land belongs to the people of Florida or the people of the United States. So leave it where it is, please don't touch it. What you could do is pin drop on your phone with Google Earth. If you find something like a projectile point, um, often they're called arrowheads, but we don't, archeologists don't use arrowhead because sometimes it's a spearhead and sometimes it's an arrow and whatever. So if you find something like that and it's like right in the middle of a hiking path, please pick it up and hide it. Just move it a few feet and hide it under the bush or the shrub. Um, Put a pin drop and you can drop an email to whoever is the managing authority over those public lands. If it's on privately held property, it is actually the possession of whoever owns the land. This makes the US very different from other countries. Most countries, archeological materials are public property regardless. Um, in those cases, again, there is, um, there is a public official known as the, the State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO, Florida has one, all states have one. You can, again, put a pin in your Google Maps and send them an email and say, hey, I found this. And the site may already be documented. We don't know, but it never hurts to let um, someone in charge of archeological resources know about it. Thank you. Thanks, I'm just, I'm just trying to look through my notes. Thank you for that information. Uh, I know some people that could probably use that. A lot of my friends that grew up in Central Florida might actually need that information. Yeah, please don't take it. Leave it where it is. Because if you move it, I can't tell you where it came from, how old it is, nothing. You have to leave it where you found it. All right, we have time for one more question. I'm going to wait to see. I'm going to slowly ask my next question to see if another question comes in. And if another question comes in by the time I finish this question, we'll take the, the next question. But I think I saw the answer for this. But I was very interested in this um, graphic you showed about the increases and decreases of food um, of the things people were consuming. Um, and I presume those all come from excavations, but can you tell me a little more about how, how you learned that? Yeah, that's a really great question. So those data actually come from people's reports of excavations. And so what you'll do is you'll dig an archeological site 
And um, I showed a picture of you know, that, that sort of solid packed shell. Um, so what you do is um, the deeper you go under, underground, the older it gets, because obviously that's how sediment forms, it accretes this way. Um, so what we can do is we can take that kind of information, we can, we can date the depth, the, date the materials that we're looking at, and then we can do essentially counts or proportions of different species for um, different periods of time, depending on where in the site it's excavated from, where in the, like how deep underground it's excavated, or different sites that we now have different dates. Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I was just super interested to see that like drum and sea trout became more prevalent. And I, again, just to echo what you're saying, you, that all comes from the sediment record, like you find it comes from the archaeological sites themselves. Yeah, so what we'll do is we will, um, you know, I'll have three archaeological sites that, that we know date before 750, and I'll have four that date after. And I'll look at the fauna, the bones and the shell that are in those, um, that are found in those archaeological sites. And we can literally, you can look at like these tiny little bones and be like, oh, this is the back fin of this specific sea catfish. And so you know that they were eating that sea catfish because it's in the archaeological sediments. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Stacy, again, uh, Dr. Barber, sorry, uh, for joining us today. Um, we are very appreciative for this talk. And uh, I, I speak for everyone in saying uh, it was very informative. And we, I don't know who I'm passing it over to next. I'm sorry, but thanks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again, everyone, for coming. Please join us on September 14th when Dr. Claire Knox comes to talk to us about disaster du jour, overlapping crises on the menu. Look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs>